Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to be here with co-host Gary Farmer. Hey, Gary. Good afternoon. How are you all? And uh, before we get started, I want to mention to everybody to uh, subscribe to the show on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash C slash film talk radio and uh, leave a comment that you've subscribed and we'll make sure to reply to each of those comments. We've got a very special guest today. She was embedded as a reporter during the Iraq war. She, her films are, uh, we are unarmed and the good mind. And they've both played at the Santa Fe independent film festival. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Gwendolyn Cates. Hey, Gwendolyn. Hey, Jacques and Gary. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to see you both. Yeah, Gwendolyn, uh, you know, independent documentary filmmaker. But, you know, just briefly tell us a bit about that career. You became known as a celebrity photographer to start for the Rolling Stone and Vanity Fair, places like that. Just a, a quick, quick introduction to some of that life. Yeah, I, I, I did that for that. That was my kind of first career, I guess. I did that for years, um, photographing celebrities and other well-known people for uh, magazine covers and features and stuff from Parade and Life to Rolling Stone and Vanity Fair and GQ and Men's Journal and Santa Fe magazine. I did some covers and I mean, just, you know, all those kind of magazines. And I photographed people from George Clooney to Rosa Parks, Oprah, God, Michael Douglas, Bill Murray, Robin Williams. I mean, there were so many, but it was very interesting. And um, it start. I lived in Chicago after that's where I went to college. I'm from New York originally. I didn't, I didn't uh, seek out celebrity photography. I just wanted to be a photographer. I started taking pictures when I was nine years old and then I started getting those assignments. So it just kind of happened. And then I lived in LA for five and a half years doing that. And then I was, I, I left LA and came back to New York and kept doing that celebrity stuff. But then I really wanted to move into more substantial storytelling, I guess. And so I started asking some of these magazines like, oh, can I do features that aren't just about, you know, I'd rather mix it up with a celebrity. And that's how I ended up doing my book. And that's how my book was how I ended up doing my first documentary film. I know your father had a, a big impact on your life. Uh, yeah. You know, he was a linguist, I understand, from my knowledge. Uh, I'm not sure, it did, you know, if was the fella, was his name David Cates? Yeah, David Cates. And um, was he a, a, a studier of, and, um, and much like Jacques, um, uh, lived on the Navajo Res, uh, certainly didn't, I'm sure, accomplish the language, but uh, your father's interest in Navajo language, uh, how, did, how did that go down? Well, when he was in college, he took a course from a very well-known anthropologist who had been studying the Navajo, and he just fell in love with the language, and he really wanted to learn it. And interestingly, he was very, very musical. He played the flute his entire life. And he just found that the language, the um, ideas behind the language and the sound of it so beautiful. He was like, I must learn it. So he went to Gallup. He ended up, he was invited to a wedding in California. And on his way back, he stopped in Gallup with no sort of plan. He didn't know how he was gonna accomplish this, but he ended up getting a job on the Santa Fe Railroad. And he also wanted to learn from very traditional people, not from, and this was in the fifties, not from, you know, his, people his age. So he ended up, they really befriended each other. These, um, these two 
good friends who were doing seasonal work on the railroad who neither of whom spoke English and they they really hit it off they all had shared a sense of humor they they just hit it off and they said to him they understood that he just really wanted to learn the language he didn't have any ulterior motives they said well come and visit and he ended up living there for the two years before i was born and he learned uh Dinebizad fluently so when i was growing up here in new york city i was always like that was part of my known universe he was always talking to Nebazad, talking about the navajo and then he started bringing me out there when i was still a, a kid there's photos of me with my little instamatic out on the res when i was 11. <laughs> and, um so his friends were very very traditional uh, very traditional people who lived really in the center of the res right next to Black Mesa. And I'm still friends with um, one family in particular because one of his friends passed away when I was in college. So I'm like friends with, you know, it's, it's really amazing with his friends, great grandchildren and, you know, grandchildren are my age and then the great grandchildren. So, yeah, he was a really important influence on my life. And he was also a really talented photographer, and he even made some movies, too. You mentioned your uh, book. Is that still available? Do you want to tell us the title of it? Um, it's easy to remember. The title is Indian Country. And, uh, yeah, that was a really extraordinary experience. Um, traveling all over Indian country in the US. I would have loved to include Canada and also always thought about doing another book that was about First Nations, you know, Canada First Nations. Um, but yeah, I traveled all over from Maine to Florida to California to Alaska and everywhere in between. And um, so it's still available. It's it's out of print, but it's still available on Amazon. And you know, I've got some copies if anybody wanted to. So you tr for the book, you travel all over Indian country and just take pictures. Uh, it sounds uh, fascinating. I love to uh, have a look once I get a chance. Well, the way that I I thought of doing the book, it's like if you got in a car and you drove around Indian country, you know what that's like, like who you run into who you might not run into. It's like, you never know who you're gonna run into. And so it was a very, I wanted it to be a very serendipitous kind of experience like that. Um, and I began at Navajo, cause that's where I began. And so it makes this journey and then you end up, you end up get in a, you know, in a circle and you end up back at, at Navajo. I mean, there was one person I photographed who I couldn't just bump into or maybe not bump into, and that was uh, Leonard Peltier. And so I did have to um, request to photograph him. And the text is all of people speaking in their own words, which I, uh, I actually didn't record, I wrote down um, what people said, but that was really important that the text be people speaking in their own words. And so with Leonard, it was, t I got turned down twice by the warden. And then finally on the third, the third attempt, um, I was able to photograph him. So it's a really broad portrait of, of Indian country, little kids, well-known people, you know, educators, uh, artists, all kinds of people. We've got a minute uh, left uh, before the break, but God, I'd love to hear a little bit of, more about photographing Leonard Peltier and, uh, and maybe we could even pick it up when we get back. Sounds great. Um, was, uh, was it um, going in there? Was it, uh, was there a feeling of, uh, 
<clears throat> of nothingness, of uh, of a pin being able to drop? Was it intense? What was it like to meet uh, one of uh, America's most famous political prisoners? Yeah, it was a pretty intense experience. I mean, all of it from the dealing with the warden and, you know, eventually getting permission, which I could talk about a little more. And then I'll never forget walking because he was in Leavenworth at the time um, and at Kansas and walking up those. It was a very intimidating uh, structure <laughs> and walking up those steps. And the warden's assistant had actually realized that you know, I didn't have any weird agenda and had been trying to help me eventually once he realized that I was, you know, definitely a professional. Um, and I, but I was only granted 30 minutes with Leonard. I had to travel all the way there for 30 minutes, but he gave me 45. And I thought to myself, you know, he never gets to visit with people. So once I had photographed him and, and you know, asked him to say some things. I just visited with him and he wanted to talk about his grandkids, how he was raising them from prison. That's what he wanted to talk about. And that was great. Let's Gwendolyn, let's pick that up when we return. Um, we're talking with Gwendolyn Cates, the uh, documentator and photographer. <laughs> 